Kansas City edition. Uh, Civic Saturday started in Seattle as a program hosted by the founders of Citizen University. Citizen University inspires belief that a strong democracy relies on strong citizens, that we all have the power to make change in civic life and the responsibility to try. We're here today to celebrate the possibilities and potential of civic power. And we're doing that right on time with the National Week of Conversation. I'm Jenny Garman, and I get to be the Legal and Government Information Specialist for the Kansas City Public Library. As you might expect, my focus is on civic literacy and legal literacy. That means I'm involved in sharing resources that help you connect as a citizen and make uh, informed decisions about voting and sharing information uh, from legal experts about our legal system, including end of life planning and all sorts of things. I'm really looking forward to Constitution Day and Citizenship Day this September. And I am Kim Guile. I'm the Community Reference Manager at the Kansas City Public Library. And I have the very distinguished pleasure and honor to work with Jenny Garman, none other than. <laughs> this is a really cool thing that we're doing in Kansas City today. Jenny Garman is a fellow with Citizen University. She's a fellow for Civic Saturday Fellowship. And that is a pretty special program that we're a part of. And having this program is a way for us to engage and support that larger fellowship with Citizen University. So we're grateful to be able to use this sort of curriculum that we have today, this format that we have today to get people excited about your own power and your own ability to affect change in the way that is important to you in the way that's meaningful to you through the mechanisms that exist within their own democracy. And so Jenny, it is just a wonderful pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm so excited that all of you are on the call with us. I'm really delighted to be here. And uh, we couldn't do this without uh, Heidi Holiday and Austin Taylor. And I hope they, um, Austin, will you introduce yourself, please? Yes, how are you guys doing? Um, my name is Austin Taylor. I am the executive director for Black Privilege. Um, but more than anything, I am a true nerd in a box. Um, <laughs> I had over COVID, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting and working with Councilman Ellington, Charles Johnson, Deetra Johnson, Omari, like that whole team for um, Councilman Third District. And they brought me in and a lot of amazing stuff has been happening. And again, a pleasure. The library is just my favorite. You guys are just amazing. And thank you everyone for showing up, for participating, so on and so forth. Hi, I'm Heidi Holiday. I'm the executive director at Consensus KC. And our goal is to engage the public for the public good. And we see Civic Saturday as a perfect opportunity to do that. So we partner with the library on quite a few events and programs throughout the year. And we are very excited to be a part of this morning event as well. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Heidi and Austin. I'm really excited about today's gathering because um, this gathering is about awesome people here in Kansas City. And we'd like you to meet um, Jelly and Brianna. We're waiting on, uh, so I hope you'd say wave and say hi, Brianna and Jelly. You'll get to hear a lot more from them later in the program. We also have uh, Darren Cobbins joining us, hopefully um, very soon, uh, and he will provide us some beautiful music. I'm excited about that. Um, so without further ado, this is Kansas City's Civic Saturday. The Kansas City Public Library, Consensus KC, and Black Privilege are partnering with Citizen University's Civic Saturday program with the idea to be a part of, as Kim mentioned, um, this broader culture of powerful responsible citizenship across the country. Um, we envision a Kansas city in which each person knows their civic power, knows how to ask questions and get answers, how to use civic tools to create the neighborhoods and city that we want. There are resources available for you at the library, like how to contact your elected officials, a template for sharing your concerns uh, with elected officials, and our newly refreshed voter engagement page. We're really pleased also to be sharing information today about Kansas City's new Office of Citizenship Engagement, Citizen Engagement. You'll see me out and about uh, sharing information about Kansas City's comprehensive plan and the Kansas City Spirit Playbook because those surveys are so important 
um, for their important tools for citizens to share what their visions and dreams for Kansas City are. So you'll see me out and about. So I hope I get to welcome to some of you while I'm on the parks with our summer reading program. We're also standing up a civic engagement team at the Kansas City Public Library. And this is a great time for you to share your ideas about what that could look like. What would you like us to focus on? What priorities would you like us to have? All of this information that I've shared already so far will be in a follow-up email and you'll have a survey that you could fill out with those ideas. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, without, oh, and let's get, just do a quick overview of what's gonna happen today. Kim, do you wanna talk about that? I sure can talk about that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> What we are going to do is we are going to have some poetry, some original poetry. Really, we are going to have a special civic reading from none other than Brianna. And if Darren is able to join us, I know he had some power difficulties due to the storm last night. If he can get in last minute, we are absolutely going to celebrate him. And then we are going to have a very special uh, interview session between Austin Taylor and Councilman Brandon Ellington, who are going to share some stories about basically the civic struggles that people might have and how, what are the ways that you can use your own civic power to resolve those challenges. And then we are going to break out into some civic circles and we'll tell you more about that later. And so if you are ready to go, Jelly, with your, um, with your original piece, I will pass it over. This to is, you. yeah, this will actually be our, our focusing moment, our centering moment, kind of taking us out of everyday life and helping us to kind of get lined up with what we hope to do today, connecting as, as a community. Thank you, Kim. Right on. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jelly, like Jellyfish, Duckworth. I I'm a community organizer here in Kansas City. I've been working with the community for about six years on the ground now. I am a very passionate woman um, that just is really cares about peacemaking. So everything from being a yoga instructor to working towards program and policy development, I merge all my loves for community and that way. So today I really uh, wanted to take a moment for us to reflect and just kind of take our time to really think about community in a way that maybe we haven't allowed ourselves to just kind of think about ways we leaned on each other this last year. And so if you have a pen or something to write with and a piece of paper near you, it doesn't have to be fancy, it can be a napkin, whatever it is, you don't need it. But if you would like to have it, it will help definitely manifest this practice I want to lead us through. So I want us to think about someone, someone very specific that we leaned on this last year to really help guide us through this last time of crisis and really think about who that person was. Was it somebody that you knew? Was it a family member? Was it a stranger? Was it a friend? And if you have something to write with, I want you to write their name down, just manifest it, put them there and focus on them, make them your focal point. So take a good look at that name, put it in your brain. And when you're ready, let's close down our eyes, more than open to keep your eyes open and just take a huge breath, let it out. This was a really intense, strong, resilient and heartbreaking year this past year. It is the one thing that we all share as global citizens and as local citizens, and that we all came out of a lot stronger. I want you to think about the individual you leaned on. How did they make you feel seen? How did they make you feel heard? How did they make you feel valued and empowered? Was it something they said? Was it something they did? 
Did you sneak in a hug even though we weren't supposed to? I want you to focus on that feeling, the way that that fulfilled the need that you needed last year. What was the moment that you needed them? How did they show up? As we reflect on our relationships with others and this individual, we think back about how we wanna take those things and how others made us feel seen and empowered and how we cultivate that moving forward with our own community. Touching individuals, whether they're strangers or our grandmothers, whether they're our friends or intimate partners. In what ways can you make others feel seen and heard and valued the way that this individual did for you? How can you take that and cultivate a larger community moving forward that is resilient and honest and supportive? As we close out, I just want to take a moment to think about that individual and say, thank you. Thank you. Keeping your eyes closed for just a little bit longer, go ahead and fill your lungs with the deepest breath. Exhale it out through your mouth. You can open your eyes and look at the people around you. All of us have had somebody to lean on this last year. And it is nice to acknowledge when we do have community around us. So just wanted to share that moment with you. Thank you. Um, right on, is, is Darren here? I don't think Darren is here just yet. And so if while we're waiting for, for Darren to join us, if you could um, turn it over to Brianna, start with that. Right on, start with great. The, with the I have the humble privilege of introducing Brianna. Hi, thank you. Hold on. This is how online things go. I love it. Um, she, Brianna is going to be doing a reading a civic text for us and she's back, right on. Back in the flesh, here she is. Okay, I'm back, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, it's great to see you all. My name is Brianna Bonner. I am a national qualifier for speech and debate, um, a spoken word poet and unapologetically pro-citizen and pro-oppressed people. Throughout my life, I've always been in love with politics, often opting to watch Crash Course AP government um, in my free time between classes. As I speak, I have my copy of literally every single document in American history right next to me at all times. Despite this, when Ms. Garman asked me to pick my favorite document in American history, I could only choose one document, the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is as philosophical as it is practical, and with proper analysis, it flips our perspective of citizens' engagement with our governments and with our public servants. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that when any government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them seems most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for lights and transient causes. And that accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind is more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. 
but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same objects invents a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for future security. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Thomas Jefferson wrote these words in 1776, further cementing the idea of a living, breathing constitution. He establishes that a government is created by its citizens. And as a result, its first purpose should be to serve those citizens. He goes further, outlining the duty of a citizen to alter or to abolish forms of government that do not provide life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson counters any argument regarding the sacredness of the constitution and the government's original form, stating, quote, that mankind is more disposed to suffer while the evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed to. I want to compare this to Huey P. Newton's writings almost two centuries later in his book, Revolutionary Suicide. Quote, there is another illuminating story of the wise old man and the fool found in Mao's little red book. A foolish old man went to the North Mountain and began to dig. A wise old man passed by and he said, why do you dig, foolish old man? Do you not know that you cannot move the mountain with a little shovel? But the foolish old man answered resolutely, while the mountain cannot get any higher, it will get lower with each shovelful. When I pass on, my son and his sons and his son's sons will go on making that mountain lower. Why can't we move that mountain? And the foolish old man kept digging and the wise old man looked on in disgust. But the resoluteness and the spirit of the generations that followed the foolish old man touched God's heart. And God sent two angels who put the mountains on their backs and moved the mountain. This is a story Mao told. When he spoke of God, he meant the 600 million who helped him move imperialism and bourgeois thinking, the two great mountains. The reactionary suicide is the wise man and the revolutionary suicide is a fool, a fool for the revolution in the same way Paul meant when he spoke of being a fool for Christ. That foolishness can move the mountain. That it is our great leap in our commitment to the dead and to the unborn. We will touch God's heart. We will touch the people's heart. And together we will move the mountain. Both these men and the many generations that come after them have stood in the same revolutionary positions. In order to move the mountains we face as a country, we must first understand and perform the civic duties we were endowed by the constitution. Only by understanding our civic duty will we move the mountain and achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. Thank you. Brianna, okay. thank you. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. What a uh, very stirring. Um, and I, I'm sorry, we don't have Darren with us yet for the music, but before we go to Austin and Councilman Ellington, I would really love to uh, start with some music. Uh, and I think Heidi, are we ready to rock with that? Uh, yes, getting it up right now. Okay, great. <clears throat> And welcome Councilman Ellington, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, just one moment and we will have that up. And I do hope Darren can join us because he, he did share that he has an original piece that he would share uh, today.
She said, you can only love what you die for, babe. But she Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Heidi. Uh, and we will turn it right over now to Austin Taylor and Councilman Ellington. Thank you again for joining us. I'm not glad to be here. <laughs> Yo. Um, so um, let me just do the introduction. Um, again, this is the Councilman Brendan Ellington. Um, beyond just his accolades from his state rep and the ordinances and the bills that he's passed and on both sides of the aisle, um, but over the past year, and again, I've only known you a little bit over a year now, and not only he and his team has brought me in, his family has brought me in, and it's just, it's truly, truly been a blessing, um, and a lot of stuff is going on. So let's just jump straight into this interview. I'm with it. I'm with um, it. Cool. You are a troublemaker, and I love it. <laughs> um, so, good trouble, brother. Good trouble. Good, good <laughs> trouble. Good trouble. Um, more than anything, I know one, is, one of the things that um, happens so many times is um, and actually, I'm going to attribute my mom for this. Um, lots of times people call individuals brutally honest, mm -hmm. but there's nothing mm -hmm. brutal about honesty. Mm -hmm. um, it's the lies that are brutal. Mm -hmm. um, how do you navigate with you being elegantly honest in a political platform of brutal liars? I'm not going to lie. I get encouraged the more uh, transparent I can be. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in the inner city, I grew up in a uh, paradox where everybody around me was honest. Now, they may have been viewed as uh, uh, negative in society, but at least they was honest in what they was doing and the acts that they was doing and, and the lifestyle that they was portraying. Uh, in a professional arena, I see too many people are fearful of, of truth, fearful of transparency, and I have nothing to hide. So I get off on it. The more honest and the more uh, transparent I can be, the better off the uh, situation is going to be. And I like watching other people in uh, the political paradigm get uncomfortable because we don't represent the same entity. Ooh, 
Yeah, uh, yeah no, that, that speaks value. Um, no, uh, and, and the reason why I, I'm, I'm laughing at like that is, again, um, not everyone is like a super nerd like I am, um, but every ordinance, just with, let's just focus on city council, mm -hmm. the position you're in right now, every ordinance that you have fought to pass or have passed have literally taken power away from the position that you're in mm -hmm. and given it to the people as at the same time one thing i've since day one i met you um i'm george fuller another shout out um is the individ individual that introduced yeah, me George's, to you guys. Cold, no. exactly um and the first thing I heard from you is like this is the no more excuses coalition mm -hmm. and can you please um for the viewers the um the quote on politics and warfare oh yeah Politics is war without bloodshed, and war is bloody politics. And that's to say that once we can no longer negotiate and agree, then it ultimately breaks down to some type of uh, conflict. And we see that whether that's governments, whether that's communities, uh, whether that's uh, racial politics, the whole nine. We just typically don't try to examine it honestly. Uh, but politics is nothing but warshed. Either we can negotiate, and there is no bloodshed, or we cannot, and there's definitely bloodshed. And then growing up in the community I grew up in, uh, there was a lot of excuses for why we didn't have stuff. Well, you know, white folks don't, uh, aren't putting uh, resources down here, or we had gentrification, or we had uh, white flight, which is all real, but is not necessarily the predominant factor of ownership. Ownership comes from actually just understanding the political paradigm and then how to use those resources for your community, how to grow that community, right? So getting involved in politics, uh, going to the no more excuses, we want to show that there is no excuses for anything. I don't care if racism is the blockages, racism is your issue. Because politically and, and policy-wise, I'm going to reconstruct these policies so you can have whatever negative opinion you want, but the policies is what dictates reality. And when we talk about redlining, that was policy. When we talk about banking, that's policy. When we talk about police laws, that's policy. When we talk about housing laws, that's policy. Uh, so the thing that I've seen in America, um, and serving at the Capitol, it actually solidified that. The thing that I've seen in America was the only thing that counted was who controls the rules and regulations of engagement. Yeah. Nothing else matters. And society typically follows those rules and regulations of engagement, which creates cul-de-sacs of culture. So we try to examine all of that. Yeah, cool. So while we're like shooting on to that, um, let's talk on... Off of the citizen engagement, mm -hmm. you know, a beast. A, and again, this is mainly. I'm going to put it before you. Even I try to out me. Yeah. Um, when we were working on the office of citizen engagement um, in the beginning, um, Kim, a good friend of mine that's um, on this as well, countless conversation. I was telling him like, this is not going to pass. Mm -hmm. This is the most craziest thing ever. Um, and then it did. Yeah. And with it. With my plan of it not passing, I was telling you literally every week that I was like, hey, yo, I'm ready to do this, this, mm -hmm. and this. We're going to out the um, political, local political arena for not passing the mm -hmm. ordinance. going to give power to the people. And then literally, you texted me like, what, 10 yep, minutes yep, after yep, this? Yep. And you was like, bro, it passed. And we went crazy. Every time I saw you for the past two weeks mm -hmm. afterwards, we were just going crazy. and just. So talk to me more about the office itself um the the ordinance itself and like how important this ordinance is uh this ordinance is actually huge when it comes to creating community self-determination yes. uh i'm gonna give you a story and i'm gonna go to the office real quick let's go and this is just to uh show the separation of when i talk about race race is a a, a social paradigm it's a social contract right. uh when i talk about ethnicity it's something that actually has a genetic uh basis to it right mm -hmm. so in jeff city i actually had a, a colleague uh and he came to me one one year a rural republic and he was like well hell l why should we give you guys more money when nothing changes and at the time it was a gentleman from kansas city that was saying he represented uh the city and he, he was dealing with probation and pro entities etc and i looked at him i said that's the issue i said it's not the dollars it's who goes who you give it to because that gentleman doesn't represent anybody the halfway house that he's talking about represents nothing uh now my colleague understood that because he's like he didn't come talk to me and I very quickly understood that in different communities, you will have people that think they're doing a good job of allocating resources. And then those resources actually never touch people that need those resources. And you have stagnation in those conversations where well, that community doesn't want you to have it when in reality, you putting the money in your pocket. So the Office of Citizen Engagement gets rid of the middleman. 
and it takes a citizen that puts a citizen to the forefront. So uh, uh, streamlines all DOJ grants. So when you talk about DOJ grants, you're talking about everything uh, from proactive to reactive elements when you talk about engagement communities, whether that's drugs, whether that's crime, whether that's infrastructure, whether that's housing, uh, homelessness, uh, the whole gambit yeah. actually falls underneath DOJ. Uh, when we talk about service providers in the city of Kansas City, uh, just by fundamental breakdown, most service providers don't live inside the inner city, right? But the dollars are generated for people in low income areas, uh, whether that's the inner city or rural areas, et cetera, but they have no ownership over those programs. So the Office of Citizen Engagement uh, mandates that the city helps with uh, qualifying language. So if an organization or an individual doesn't know how to actually write their grant, the city has to do it. It uh, also codifies the fact that the city has to go into new uh, contract services, expanding services. Yes. But the only way you can expand services is actually partnering with organizations that do exactly. A, B, C, D, and E. Yes. It also has a rubric in there which will give us accountability, something that we haven't had before. Uh, so in previous years, uh, the council would just allocate money to maybe a crime prevention program or, or entity that's supposed to do conflict resolution, but there was no requirements on reporting or curriculum. Or anything that people get. So there's no transparency nature when it comes to allocation of funds. It changes that. It also streamlines the 301 process and the my case the on out process. Uh, and it also has language in there for active uh, uh, educational engagements in the community, meaning they have to go in the community, they have to break down the budget process, the financial process, the grant process, how to access grants, what grants are available, et cetera. Uh, so it, it's an office that does what government originally was created to do. Exactly. The government, in my opinion, was originally created to be articulation collectively of citizens' voices. Uh, it kind of grew to be more corporate, but this brings it back. Yeah. Again. And it's beautiful. It's scary. And I was able to be awesome, man, because you said it wasn't going to pass. <laughs> but, but it's sad that he was willing to do more work than anything to actually show people what could be, but government wouldn't allow to happen. Mm -hmm. We was just blessed to be able to get it done and be able to show vote. Yeah, cool. So um, mainly because we're like we're, we're live and everything like that. I want I know one thing that I was telling a friend of mine. We spoke about this um, previously. Um, they asked like outside of councilman being a friend of yours now and and everything like that. Um, why do you like Councilman Ellison? And I was like, he reads. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that like it it irks me is leadership that doesn't do their research, leadership that doesn't do their due diligence, and leadership that doesn't know how to properly serve. What I know you get tired, you're human. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um, but what makes you consistently? Because you've been like this yeah. since rep since you've been a representative. Yeah, you've been like this since you was doing mixtapes. Yeah, like yo, that real tough. Yeah, real tough. But what makes me read everything, and I have to bring it back to the state. When I first got elected to the state, I'm not a typical cookie cutter politician, right? So I literally came from street activity, doing uh, uh, hip hop music, and then going to the Capitol. So in doing all of that, most of my colleagues were either lawyers, political family members, uh, doctors, uh, people that had credentials, of, uh, uh, indoctrinated credentials, right? Mm -hmm. I went to this university, I got this degree, and this is why I'm great, this is why I should be here. Well, I just came from the streets and I had to understand people around me and how to articulate what some of them couldn't say where you can understand. Uh, so getting to the Capitol, not only did I want to show people that I was smarter than what you thought, I wasn't the dumbest one in the room, but in all reality, it would actually go back to college. Uh, so when I went to college, I was about 21. I went to young case. Uh, so I'm sitting in that college room. And I didn't go to college because I wanted to get a degree. I went because it was going to give me some free money. But this is extremely important because it kicked off my political career. Uh, in my philosophy class, my uh, teacher, he asked all the students about philosophy. Well, I'm watching kids' hands go up. I read him in sixth grade. I read him in fifth grade. Uh, I'm 22, 21. I've never heard of this individual before. So in college, I was like, I'm not going to be the stupidest one here. So I started studying just to show myself that you got me messed up. Bro. I don't care what you got. 15 years ago, we on the same plan. Getting to the Capitol was that same mentality. Yeah. But with the observation that everybody looked at me like I was just a street cat. But that's cool. You could look at me like I'm a street cat because that gives me the ability to understand for white folks, for black folks, for Latinos, et cetera. Because I understand the culture in which they come from because poverty is synonymous. Yeah. 
So as a council member, and it, so let's let's play with like the dynamic of, and we had this conversation several times, dynamic, dynamic of power um, and responsibility. So as a state rep, you had a lot more authority to making sure things got done the right way mm -hmm. than with as a city council member, you have to literally jump through like 18 hoops. Yeah. Talk on that and then like we can like move forward. Everything the else. Uh, power pendulum is definitely different. Uh, at the state, I like the ability. Well, I was involved in closing out Crossroads. Crossroads is a correctional facility that took away 26% of the population when it comes to Kansas City, Cobb County, and uh, uh, the Cobb actually got that uh, uh, tax benefit. Uh, the only reason I said all of that is we was able to shut down that penitentiary. And when you look at the penitentiary numbers, you'll see more so-called minorities is locked up for nonviolent offenses than violent offenders. So you have more rapists, murders, et cetera, that's not locked up. You have a whole bunch of drug offenders. Uh, so legislatively, that large uh, pendulum, I love. Coming home, though, you have more access to people. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that was the, uh, uh, the issue innate issue that I had. So when I was at the Capitol, I went from being vice chair to uh, Black Caucus to chair to Black Caucus to Democratic Whip. But most of my constituents would call me for city issues because they didn't understand the position in which I was in. They didn't understand that, you know, I'm in a position in which I can actually literally tap the governor, but you're calling me about city issues because you can't get a council person. Well, I needed to come home and organize, not only to show God, people the difference in politics, like the difference in the levels of politics, yeah. but also how to actually uh, tie down some of these bleeding elements in our community. Uh, so I did lose a little bit of legislative, not a little bit. I lost a lot of legislative power uh, coming back to the city, but I gained uh, the ability to be in more close proximity to constituents. Uh, and this is extremely important because uh, you will often hear me talk about race, you will often hear me talk about poverty, you will often hear me talk about un un unequal institutional access. And, and able to uh, have be in close proximity, then you can actually cross pollinate cultures. Mm -hmm. Being in uh, Jeff City, it was more partisan, and I was able to work across the aisle because people had a political ideology, but they was willing to listen because they had no innate ownership. Coming home, people have innate ownership, so they don't really want to change or want to rock the boat. But it's a necessity that we get more civilians involved and consciously understand it, and then we don't have the. Uh, racial disparity issues we don't have the unequal access to institutions or the unequal allocation of dollars yeah so then my last question then would be how best can citizens interact not only with just with your office but with the city of kansas city yeah all right first of all i would encourage the citizens of kansas city to attend city hall like one of the things that i find troubling is uh i served eight and a half years in jefferson when the whole time I was in Jeff City, I'm used to people coming from four or five hours away, regardless of what part of Missouri they are, to come up there to testify, to listen to what's going on, or to just mm -hmm. complain to their legislative, uh, not only their legislative, but complain to everybody, like, we don't like what you're doing, or you should be doing this, et cetera. Coming to Kansas City, uh, if you live in uh, Blue Springs, Independence, Raytown, uh, wherever around the Kansas City metro area, it's only about 15 minutes away from City Hall. And I find it troubling that City Hall is uh, ignored because uh, now you're talking about your tax dollars and local political positions have more direct benefits or negative than the federal or the state government. Yeah. Uh, so first, I would encourage people to come down there, attend committee hearings, watch Channel 2, and email us. Because the more elected officials know that you're paying attention, the less likely they are to go against a collective with, even if they internally don't believe that. Uh, the second aspect of that is you can email me at brandon.linkincasemo.org or you can meet us at the Robert J. Moorhart Center the first Monday and the fourth Monday of every month. We'd be here from uh, 12 o'clock. We do the No More Excuses Coalition. Uh, we have First Fridays every first Friday, uh, 12 p.m. at the Corner Restaurant on 18th Vine. With that, we bring in all uh, department heads. So any issue that you guys may have, whether it's trash, streets, roads, police, whatnot, they can be addressed right there. We try to do that in real time. Uh, um, then we also have family movie nights, so you can catch us tomorrow. Yes, yeah, tomorrow, right? Uh, yes. Sundays. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Will Smith's Aladdin, and we're selecting movies that would actually subconsciously create a cost culturalistic understanding or buying factor. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's one of the biggest hindrances in uh, civilian 
engagement is that we look at our cul-de-sacs and we don't understand that there's more universal uh, needs than there are differences. Yeah. Well, no. Um, well, and then again, I should have actually started with this. We are actually right now at the Robert Mohart building. Um, today has been a crazy day from, again, with you and Mr. Johnson, that's like an older brother than me, uh, Uncle Johnson, we were joking yeah. about yesterday. But um, literally, we did a community cleanup this morning. Um, we had the resource fair, literally, mm -hmm. like a few feet away from us right yep. now. Um, and it's still like right now, we have um, GYRL yep. and Young Kings and Young Princesses. We're running with that. Um, we're doing, the, of course, Civic Saturday. Um, and then tomorrow, of course, um, what park will the- um... uh, Spring Valley Park tomorrow. We encourage everybody to come down there. We'll start at 530, uh, going to 10. And again, the whole underlying rationality is creating and connecting communities. Yes. And we have several events planned for the summer. Uh, and everything that I do is trying to actually break the old political paradigm where people think a, politi a politician is somebody that sits on the hill and having people understand that a proletarian is somebody that actually articulates concerns with those collectively around it. So again, bro, thank you so much. I definitely <laughs> truly, truly appreciate you. Um, and then, yeah, so I guess we're opening up for a few questions if you have any questions, and then we can go on with the rest of our event. Yes, please. And thank you again so very much. That was a lot of great information. And I put some links in the chat about city officials and the weekly meetings, weekly agendas, uh, and also the ordinance uh, that started the Office of Citizen Engagement. I love it. I'm excited to be a part of it moving forward. Um, if we have any questions, I would say let's take a couple, couple minutes here and open it up if anybody's feeling brave today. And if I I will say also that if you're interested in asking a question anonymously, you can send it directly to me and that's fine. I will ask it um, on your behalf, totally anonymously. And I will say, uh, Councilman Ellington, is there a particular thing that keeps coming up? Like, is there a particular problem or a repeat that you just, you want people to know this is the answer? Like, is there a quick, mm. keeps bubbling up? That's a, that's a hard one because I get a lot of them. I would say that the quickest answer, though, would be community organizing. Because uh, I, I get a different specific questions depending on what community I am. But the thing that I find, uh, the, the separating factor between affluent communities and non-affluent communities is that affluent communities are more willing to uh, organize despite liking each other. And uh, non-affluent communities have to get in that same mindset that we don't have to like each other to actually organize and make sure we bring in benefits to our community. Are there any resources for people who don't speak English that are in this community? Yeah, uh, uh, I don't have them all off the top of my head, but in my district, uh, both, both of my uh, districts, my former state district and my current city district uh, has a lot of, uh, I don't like the word immigrant, uh, by, by blood, I'm native and I'm African, uh, but there's a lot of folks that come from different countries and different areas. Uh, so in my area, I have a very diverse mix. Uh, when you hit the Northeast area, uh, there is a lot of different resources. I have a few people that uh, have come on board uh, since I've been on the council and actually helped me uh, translate my stuff. They do it on their own, they volunteer for it, but they take my materials, my flyers and different stuff and they translate it for their communities. And with the No More Excuses Coalition, uh, COVID slowed us down a little bit. One of the things that we've been trying to do is organize in every community. So there is a lot of resources out there for people that speak different languages, uh, depending on where you come from. And if you need help with any of that, uh, email me at brandon.ellingtonkcmo.org and I get you everything. And there's various resources from the state on down. Awesome. Thanks. Kelly, it looks like Kelly has a question for you. Um, good morning. Um, I have a question, um, Councilman. Um, is there a code of civility that council members uh, must um, follow or adhere to during city? Oh, you couldn't hear me. No, no, there is not. Uh, typically in politics, you have uh, underlined decorum. At the Capitol, there was actually that code of engagement in which you speak of. So if you was talking to a, a legislator that uh, was a different gender, you have to identify as either lady or, 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 or the representative from such and such district, whichever their district number is. Uh, the capital was more formal when it comes to engagement mechanisms. 
uh, since I've been on the council, if you watch any council meetings, you'll see that depending on the day, I will make issues off of the lack of following process procedures and even understanding basic uh, 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 rules of engagement. On the council level, we use uh, Robert's Rules of Order. At the Capitol, they use the Jefferson Manual. So it's a different uh, uh, structure, but no, there is no rules of engagement on the council level or rules of civility on the council level, nor is there any um, underlying connective rule of organizing. This is one of the things that I didn't notice before I came here. Uh, and I think without having a directive, it creates independent uh, fiefdoms. And the council should have more of a, a universal directive because we fix streets in Northland and we fix streets in South Kansas City, that's still transit. But currently, there's been no, what's the word I want to use? Uh, there's been no historical element of collective thinking, which I don't actually get because it's only one city. Like community. Yeah, like Jeff City, I can actually understand the variances because you had partisanship. And then right. you also had a uh, lower segment of the states that did never intersect. Right. So when you talk about dollars for like light tech, I can understand why a rural area wouldn't get it, but they would need it more than we do. The exactly. same when it came to Medicaid expansion. On the council level, I don't understand the lack there of, of universal understanding that if I build it in your area, it benefits the tax base. If you build it in this area, it generates more revenue. I don't, I don't get that. And Kelly, I see that you have a question. We had one uh, written in from Brandon. If I could just go ahead with that. It's uh, explain the difference between three, uh, 311 and the Office of Citizen Engagement. Will yeah. this newly created office rely on folks to make contact in order to learn about a specific financial ability or will there be classes to get no. basics of education? No, nah, the uh, language in the Office of Citizen Engagement, I'm gonna figure out which one is in real quick. Uh, all right, section four, that the Office of Citizen Engagement will be responsible for performing outreach activities to inform residents of grants programs that are available to residents. The city will work with other city departments to expand grants and other programs to residents. Uh, the Office of Citizen Engagement will work with city departments and community organizations to increase awareness, access to services provided through the federal, state, and local government. The Office of Citizen Engagement will work with other city departments and community organizations to expand services under the grants from the United States Department of Justice uh, and assist residents with qualified language. There's nine sections in the Office of Citizen Engagement. Uh, out of the nine sections, uh, there's only two that doesn't deal with mandating how the city has to engage the citizens. So to directly answer the question, no, uh, we're still tightening all the votes up, but no, you would not have to look for the Office of Citizen Engagement. Uh, once the director is solidified, and we're very close to that, uh, the director will guarantee by mandate that they're actually out there engaged in the community. Currently, Austin has been doing a lot of work that the office will be doing uh, once all the votes is established, as far as the QR codes, the uh, community meetings, and all of that. So no, answer the question about 311. 311 was a separate department. What the Office of Citizen Engagement does is it uh, brings 311 into here. So now it coordinates all 311 calls. In previous years, I'm just going to use Austin as an example. Austin will be the water department, and um, this remote will be uh, pu uh, pu public works. Uh, and the citizen will call in and have a complaint at 311. It may never get routed to the water department. Public works may get a, a one routing, but since the water department never got it, nothing gets fixed. Uh, it coordinates all of that. So when you call 311, now we can actually track the call, we can see where it came in, and then it goes directly to the department. So you should see immediate uh, increases in, in response time. And then as well, uh, more than anything, I urge everyone to download the MyKC app, mm -hmm. because again, now it's literally streamlining and making an amazing process. Actually this morning, while we were cleaning up, we saw a property that um, had weeds taller mm -hmm. than my waist and literally so what i end up doing instead of like like oh this complaint literally took a pic went to my kc yep. app took a picture of it uploaded the complaint and literally by um monday i know i'm going to end up getting a reply so again it's it's amazing right now and uh, my case, no i just was tagging in real quick it'd be real short my kcmo app is essential it's actually wrapped up in the office of citizen engagement but uh, like austin said it streamlines the, the, the data uh, even if you don't have a picture, we get out. But uh, by creating that connective uh, uh, piece, not only can we see what's going on, we can address it in real time. I, I just wanted to share too, I, sh I put a link in there to the ordinance and there's a really neat PowerPoint slide, yeah. slide deck that kind of shows how that, how that works. So 
I can reshare that um, link of it. So that would be helpful. We have no, two more. Be. We have two more questions, and then uh, we're going to move on to our uh, to Jelly um, for for poetry. So Heidi, would you share the question you received, please? Yeah, we received a question over email that was talking about exercise facilities and the disparities in what is available at the various exercise facilities across the city. So the example of, um, you know, everyone is paying the same amount. Um, they're paying their tax dollars. It's supported by that. They're paying membership fees. And then uh, there's, there's an inequality of like not even having pool noodles or the equipment needed for group classes or mats. So that older folks don't slip in the in the showers. Um, so if you could address that, that would be great. All right. So y'all finally got me. This is one that I don't have a clean answer. So uh, I do understand the problem. Uh, in my district, there's several facilities that I think is underfunded. Uh, the budget process is not a process that I'm used to here at the Capitol. I'm used to the budget process in which legislators have direct access to line items. So if a legislator wants to increase access, it's extremely easy. On the city level, you typically get the departments that create their budget, abstract of line items. Uh, since I've been on the council, I've been extremely uh, loud about giving me line items. Uh, I cannot tell you when we'll be able to fix that because it is a budget issue. It's us actually allocating stuff. Uh, I can tell you what I used to do as a state rep. I used to bring senators and representatives from different areas, St. Louis County, et cetera, down to Kansas City, so they could see how horrible our community centers actually were when it came to resources from computers to uh, access for elderly folks when, when it comes to walking ramps and all of that good stuff. But I don't have a clean answer. That's a budget issue. And currently the council, and this is not a knock on my colleagues, currently the council doesn't see line items. And the only reason I was so animate is because I came from a political entity in which line items was a regular as a mandate. Uh, but you can send me in the complaints for what community centers you're talking about, and I can try to help you out. But I don't have a clean answer for that one. And then I know we just got a question in, um, and the question state, and actually I can feed into it as well with some of the work I've been doing with the office. But I respect and acknowledge um, a person's not born in this country. Does this new office provide engagement for people with no legal status to the U.S.? All right, that's another hard one. Yeah. Uh, no, yes and no. So uh, locally, uh, you don't necessarily see the local entities going after folks. As a state representative, I actually try to create a few pieces of legislation that will protect people that came over here. In the state of Missouri, there's not a lot of uh, strong protections for anybody that is not naturalized here in the states. Uh, if you do know somebody that needs help, uh, contact me and we can kind of work on it offline depending on where they because I know a lot of people are scared of government and entities because ice and all type of other things uh, but the city doesn't actually go after people um, state doesn't have strong protections uh, I do know where certain resources is at and I'm, I'm more than willing to help out and then as well um, through literally a great push from Councilman Elton Ms. Dietrich and Mr. Johnson I um, had the honor of like speaking at a few local mosques, a few mm -hmm. local um, synagogues, temples, and just different religious settings um, throughout Kansas City. So in the first district, mm -hmm. um, um, third district, fifth district, um, so on and so forth. And a lot of them are really, really actually um, excited about the Office of Citizen mm -hmm. Engagement because the Office of Citizen Engagement will be able to provide directly to the community. Yeah. And if those people, and that's why he said, yeah, yeah, no, yep, 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 exactly. Yep. So if those people are in those communities, they'll be directly affected. So when we're talking about crime prevention, cool, we'll um, partner with a local mosque that's been doing each one teach one since the 80s, mm -hmm. but never been receiving any city funds or city supports or government support. Cool, we'll be able to actually amplify their services by partnering with Office of Citizen Engagement, in turn, helping individuals that are not um, legal yet. Because again, if you're here, hopefully you're wanting to be legal and we're trying to help that process. Well, let me expand on that. I'm actually glad you said because uh, when, when you first asked the question, I was thinking about uh, processes that I know, already knew was out there and entities that I already, already knew was out there. But the Office of Citizen Engagement directly touches in the DOJ dollars. Yes. All of that is actually uh, 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 accessible through DOJ. So even if there is not a program currently and the community knows of the need, they can actually create that program through this office. Uh, and again, it touches all DOJ grants. It's not 
one element that it doesn't touch. It's not dialed down to drug dollars. It's not dialed down to uh, anything like that. It's everything that DOJ had. And by being a former state rep, I understood that most programming dollars that cities get come from DOJ. And then they re-grant those dollars in the apparatus in which the cities or the local municipalities would like to do. This, again, takes away the middleman. So we're not even worried about what the local municipalities' ideology may be. We're worried about the access and the apparatus and the umbrella of the uh, Department of Justice, which is everything. Yes. So uh, I'm actually glad you said that. So yeah. even if it's not a program that you see in your community, the reason we create the Office of Community Engagement is so communities can have community self-determination and the funding to actually a part of that. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so very much for taking the questions. I want to try uh, Kelly's question one more time, and then um, we're going to uh, go to Jelly for her poetry. I cannot wait to hear it. Um, the Kelly's question, she wanted to clarify it a little bit, is are council members expected to adhere to certain formal politeness and courtesy and behavior during city council meetings? Like, is there, could somebody, is like, is there a sergeant at arms somewhere who would be like, no, 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 you're, you're being too loud or no, 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 you can't use that kind of language. I guess, I think, Kelly, can you give me a thumbs up? Is it sort of like that? Okay. Yeah, no, nah, and again, uh, it should be when you talk about government, but no, uh, at the state level, we use the Jefferson Manual. On the council level, they're supposed to use robber rules of order. Uh, if you watch the council hearing, you'll see me object sometimes and throw out procedural rules that people don't actually understand. So there's a fundamental breakdown. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say it two ways. Yes, they should be following robber rules of order, which actually has standards in there. Uh, but currently, there's a fundamental breakdown of understanding those actual processes. At the state, there was no way of getting out of those processes. If you did not follow the Jefferson Manual and know how to do your uh, rules, amendments, uh, and all of that good stuff, you cannot talk. And the same with engagement. There is no mechanism here in how you have to address a council person. Uh, how do you have to uh, raise up to the mic? The uh, question about the sergeant of arms, it is my understanding that one of the council members is a sergeant of arms, which again is not standard when it comes to how a governmental body should actually work. There should actually be a sergeant of arms in case somebody gets out of line, they're removed, but that will go back to the end of process. I think personally that for several years, I'm not just talking about this council, I think for several years, the council, for whatever reason, has never followed procedures. And now we're doing a little bit more procedures, but that's because I would throw out a point of order and stand on it because I know you have to follow rival rules of order because that's what's in your charter. But uh, currently the practice is not um, implemented. Right. Okay, thank you very much for that. And thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Uh, again, I look forward to working with you and seeing this really come together and be real. Um, so without further ado, I would like to, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to Jelly. We're gonna hear Jelly's poetry. And then we're gonna go to breakout rooms for our civic circle. So we're uh, really part of our national week of conversation. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you all in the breakout rooms. So Jill, and thank you again, Councilman Ellington. Thanks Austin for a great interview. <laughs> all right, to Jelly, please. Hello again. <laughs> um, I forgot to mention that I also am a poet. I love spoken word. Um, so I, created a piece today, an original piece that was um, intentional from a larger piece I wrote to myself about healing from my own trauma and learning to lean on others in times of crisis. And just a little note, like my work in community organizing has made me become the most transparent and the most honest I can be with others and therefore myself. And with that, it just opens up to so many doors to each and one of our personal truths. Mm -hmm. And uh, through conversation, I've just learned that there we have more in common than we do not. And so this piece is, this poem is less of a call for unity and more of a call to settle our differences through conversation. And it is called The Choice. I choose to see your innocence before you were left scarred by injustice. It's the same naivety I so firmly gripped to before I was taught a world of resentment. 
To have a child look through tinted windows, barred and dusty, is to limit his worldview in adolescence and crush his dreams in adulthood. And yet we wonder why we question our worthiness when we've normalized such empty surroundings. To bicker and bite tongues around our own oppressions, personal and political, is to silence our points of pain that make us more alike. Hush the song of our kinship. And yet we wonder why we cry for freedom when we've become captive by the illusion of hate, a victim of its falsehood. I choose to hold your hurt before you go on hurting others. It's the same ordinance of someone else's unhealed pain before they violated my own purity. So to want and to cultivate peace comes after understanding that resentment is far too easy to perpetuate, comes after shaking our spirit of this anger and breaking down the walls we built to protect ourselves from what? From what? To kiss cheeks and to heal wounds, intentional and fulfilling, is to voyage the courageous ship of peace, the passage towards justice. Thank you. Shelly, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm mm -hmm. grateful for, um, for all of you. Um, none of this would have been possible um, without a great group of people coming together. Um, thank you to Councilman Ellington and, and Deidre Johnson, Austin Taylor and Heidi Holiday. Jelly and Brianna and Kim Guile. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us. It means a lot to know that wherever you are, uh, we are building this civic community together and we are all ready to show up for each other. Thank you so much for being a part of this event and with your participation in Civic Circles, like I mentioned, which is coming up here very shortly, um, we'll start uh, Kansas City's National Week of Conversation. Jelly. Thank you again. It was beautiful. Brianna, thank you again. Austin, thank you. Everybody, I'll see you in the breakout rooms. <laughs>